The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The 
The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The proceeding will Portcullis House, the Grimmond Room. Portcullis House, the Grimmond Room. Since September, welcome, Steve. Your second stint in the job. Uh, Sir Chris Wormold is obviously permanent secretary, and we also have Professor Lucy Chapel from the department. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Secretary of State, strikes across the NHS are self evidently one of the major challenges facing the service at this time. What is your plan to end them? Well, we uh, are engaging with the trade unions. I, I think if you look at the last meeting we had, the uh, the chair of the NHS Staff Council, uh, Sarah Gordon, said that our discussion had been constructive and that's very much the tenure in which we are engaging with trade union colleagues. We recognise that the NHS has been under huge pressure through the pandemic uh, and also the pressures that many others in society face from the cost of living also apply to those working within the NHS. So we recognise both in terms of the demand from COVID uh, the demand we saw over Christmas in terms of the huge spike in flu, over a hundred times the number of people in hospital with flu compared to the same time last year, a very sudden spike in terms of a sevenfold increase in the space of a month going into December, on top of a high ongoing uh, level of COVID that the system itself was under huge pressure. Um, but also that comes in the wider economic context that society as a whole, it, given the cost of the pandemic, given the impact of inflation from the war in Ukraine, has also seen cost of living pressures and NHS staff are all part of that. So we're engaging with trade union colleagues. I've had a series 
of meetings uh, with them. We do have a process through the independent pay review body, which is one indeed opposition colleagues, so certainly the Labour front bench, also support a independent pay review body process. Uh, we recognise, as you know, Chair, uh, given the difficulties that we should accept in full the recommendations last year, which we did uh, in terms of last year's pay, uh, that came on top of the 3% that was awarded to NHS uh, staff at a time when the rest of the public sector had a pay freeze the year before. Uh, and we're keen to work with trade union colleagues uh, and indeed have had discussions with them in the context of this coming year's pay review body to best reflect those ongoing pressures within the NHS that play through in uh, retention issues for staff, which the committee may want to explore, uh, and so that we can reflect inflation alongside the other Treasury equities, which other colleagues in government uh, will want to reinforce in terms of the wider affordability of any pay deal given the size of the NHS workforce. It's very much looking to next year's round, but of course, you know, as we heard this morning when Philippa Heard was before us, you know, they will report in the spring, in, in later in April, um, and that may move the dial on this industrial action, but of course that's still, what, three or two and a bit months away. So should we expect any movement on industrial action between now and then? We're, we've got the process through the pay review body that is about looking at what's happened since last year. That's the very tenet of the evidence uh, that government submits, that uh, other representatives uh, submit to the pay review body. Indeed, I think the witness evidence this morning was referencing the fact that there is evidence from a, a, a wild field, including some trade unions uh, within that. Um, in terms of our engagement, um, my evidence to them in February, that is still the timeline and the plan. I think one of the issues trade union colleagues have raised with me is often the length of time until the final decision is taken and how that can have an impact um, in terms of the backdating of the decision of the pay review body. So we're very keen to work with the trade unions to see how we ensure that the process is completed in an expedited way. I know the evidence in terms of the department, and this came up this morning, being submitted has been delayed slightly, but that's so we could take on board the representations of the trade unions and have those further discussions, not just within health, but across other departments as well. And that's been very much a cross-government initiative which okay. uh, reflected the PM so The Treasury have submitted evidence to Philippa Hurst's committee, but DHSC haven't. It's 20 days past when they wanted it. And I, I know she wrote to you just before that time. So, so are you saying that you're taking into account the unison paper on behalf of the NHS trade unions? You're taking all that into account. Uh, when can they expect your evidence? Because right now they've got a bit of a gap in their evidence base, haven't they? I think that came up this morning in Indeed. your session. I think it's 21 days uh, was the point that and was And they were raised. very diplomatic, but they're also very frustrating. No, no, and, I, and it's fair, but I think there's a, there's a reason, and a very constructive reason for that, which is, as the Prime Minister said a few weeks ago, we didn't want to take anything off the table. We wanted to have further engagement with trade union colleagues. Uh, I had those discussions uh, along with the Minister of State for Health on behalf of the Department of Health and Social Care, but they were also taking place across other departments. So whilst we completed ours... Uh, some time ago. There's been a need to wait for other departments to also have those discussions. That is a cross-government process coordinated by uh, the Treasury, uh, and once the Treasury is happy for the department to submit, then obviously we're ready to do so. On timeline, uh, Ms Heard said this morning that what would have happened in the past, what has happened in the past, is that in September they'd get the remit letter, then early in the year they'd produce their report in time for the budget, which would then uh, accept, or otherwise, in lieu of the 1st of April, to inform April pay packets. Now they got their remit November, that's happened for the last two years, and their aim now the best they can do, they say, is the end of April, which obviously then is some backdating, maybe some more if they are over generous and that's accepted. Um, could we have some acceptance from you that to get back to the September remit letter would be a good place to be? Yes, I, I think the point you raised, Chair, is a very fair one, and it's one actually I've had constructive engagement with the trade unions on, which is uh, I don't think either party wants the final conclusion of the pay review body to be uh, as late as it has been yeah. in recent years. Um, so I think there's common cause 
on that. I think there's been a very constructive reason why the remit letter went in on the 16th of November and why there's been the further discussions on evidence before submitting, not least so we could take on board some of the trade union concerns, because as you know, uh, Chairman, that uh, a number of the trade unions have expressed concern about engaging with the pay review body process uh, as a whole. And so we wanted to make sure that the evidence best reflected the wider economic circumstance. Obviously, inflation uh, forecasts have moved significantly uh, both ways. They moved. If you go back to uh, the SR21, they were forecast to peak at 4% mm. when the SR21 uh, agreement was reached. Obviously, we then ended up peaking at 11%, which has been very different. And that's been a key factor that trade union colleagues have been raising in terms of their representation. So I think it's been right to have those discussions. I think it's also reasonable that these are cross-government because the centre will want to obviously take on board the discussions the Education Secretary is having with the, the teaching unions and, okay. and other ministers and so okay. forth. So, so that's the process Thanks. that we've, we've engaged other in. Other colleagues are going to probably be the subject. Final one for me. Uh, last week in your topical statement at Oral Questions, you announced this major conditions strategy. Um, I think it is fair to say that it has caused some concern in the cancer community. So, three quotes. Uh, cancer Research UK. It's very disappointing that ministers have opted to publish a catch-all major condition strategy rather than the ambitious 10-year cancer plan they had originally promised. Pancreatic Cancer UK. Uh, we struggle to see how the urgent and detailed action we need on pancreatic cancer and other less survivable cancers can be achieved within a strategy spanning six enormous health areas. Macmillan. At a time when cancer services are already under immense pressure, Macmillan are worried that the focus on cancer will be diluted or downgraded in light of this change. Secretary of State, what can you say to the cancer community to alleviate their concerns that cancer has been downgraded as a result of its inclusion in a major conditions strategy? Well, firstly, I can absolutely reassure you that that isn't the case. Uh, it is very much a central part of our focus. And in fact, if you go back to the statement I gave to the House on the first day uh, when the House resumed uh, after the Christmas recess, uh, I talked, and, and the CMO, uh, Professor Chris Whitty, has talked about our three-stage uh, response. So the first bit, which the 250 million was talking to, was that immediate a &E pressure that we'd seen. The second part was what I announced to the House yesterday in terms of the urgent and emergency care recovery plan, which is about building resilience into next year. And the third bit is around the prevention bit, which is what we also need to lean into if we're going to shift the dial in terms of the NHS. And I think the reality on cancer, and I know not least from your time as a minister in the department, that this is also something you've always taken a leadership position on, is a quarter of us are living with more than one health condition and two thirds of cancer patients have at least one other condition. So I think to understand why we're looking at this holistically, the fact is that we need to start reflecting the fact that many patients have more than one condition. And what we've tended to have is a medical system which has seen greater specialization, but more siloed operating. And I think we need to look more holistically at how we treat the whole okay. rather than treat single conditions. And that's even more so as we see an older population where that older population tends to have more than one health condition. So, so this is particularly targeted, amongst other things, to the cancer community, because as I say, two thirds of cancer patients have um, at least one other condition. So I think hopefully that gives some reassurance at that more holistic way of looking at how we approach these Secretary major State, conditions. I, I just want to, we just want to be sure that, you know, when you look at the, the two-week wait, you know, 78.8% of people were seen by, with, by especially within two weeks. The target is 93%. You look at the 28-day faster diagnosis standard, which, you know, declare mm. my interest, I, I implemented as a minister, 69.7% were told definitively they did or didn't have cancer within four weeks of an urgent referral, the target is 75%. You know, when we had Kelly Palmer and Professor Peter Johnson before us in one of our early topical sessions, you know, they are, I know they're working their socks off to make sure that we meet our cancer standards, but, you know, we, far from, we can't let anything slip because this is, it's a serious situation with cancer services and, and I think people want to, to be assured from you that in your condition strategy, cancer will um, will have its rightful place yep. and focus from you as Secretary of State. Well, I'm firstly very happy, Chair, to give that assurance. And 
knowing your interest in this, you can imagine when we were drawing up the major conditions uh, approach, you know, we had that in mind uh, as well. And you mentioned Macmillan, who I think are an absolutely key stakeholder uh, in this regard. And if I can just quote back from Macmillan, uh, Macmillan previously said, the presence of long-term conditions is associated with poorer cancer survival rates and a higher level of need. We need to care for the whole person with cancer, not just treat single diseases and their individual symptoms separately. So Macmillan themselves have previously called for national policies to consider the impact of other conditions on cancer. That's what we're doing with the major conditions strategy. There is one exception to that, and uh, maybe Mr. Morris and some others in the committee have a particular interest in this, given, again, their past work. But on suicide, we do think that is something that warrants a separate suicide strategy, because that doesn't fit in quite the same way within the approach we're taking on the major conditions. So there will be a separate approach in terms of taking that forward. Okay. But obviously mental health as a whole fits within the major conditions paper. Right. Well, we'll come on to mental health in a bit. Right, Dr Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, I've got three questions on three quite different uh, areas. The first one leads on from, from cancer to some extent. One of the, the things we know of a preventable cause of cancer is tobacco smoking. Um, the government uh, uh, requested the Khan Review, which was published last June. And then Secretary of State committed both to using the information to inform his uh, health inequalities paper and also to um, publish a tobacco control plan. So there's that kind of very difficult message to balance, both to get people who are smoking to stop or to vape instead, whilst preventing children from taking up either. Um, what, what, what response have you got to that? How, when would your tobacco control plan be published? Uh, so I think firstly, I think everyone recognises when you look at the, and I'm sure Professor Chappell will talk about some of our prevention work in terms of smoking cessation as well, but everyone recognises in the context of lung cancer the centrality of our approach in terms of smoking uh, cessation. Uh, I think there's a number of areas where we can be innovative uh, as part of that. So. Um, we may later in the session come on to some of the regulatory flexibilities uh, that we have as a result of leaving the European Union. One uh, I was looking at last week was in the context of vaping. Then actually the dosage level of vaping actually can be flexed in terms of our regulatory freedom to better shift people away from smoking into vaping. So what we're looking at within the context of our wider prevention work is firstly recognising that smoking cessation is absolutely core. Cool to our approach uh, on uh, tackling lung cancer, which is extremely difficult in terms of treatment, so but looking at some of the regulatory freedoms. Well, I know Lucy might want to add. The question uh, really is, when will, the plan, when will your plan be published? It was committed to for last year, but it hasn't been published yet. We haven't, uh, haven't set out a, a firm date uh, on that. We're doing further work. The priority has been around the, the three recovery plans in terms of cutting waiting time. So there's been a particular focus on that uh, in recent weeks, but what I'm signaling Dr. Johnson, is, is the fact that we absolutely recognise the importance of smoking cessation within the wider approach uh, to, to cancer. I would I'd very much agree, and I, I think we need to see it in the framing of the, the benefits that come both in, in terms of cardiovascular disease and the excess deaths that we're seeing there, and in terms of cancer prevention. Um, and it sort of really goes back to the major condition strategy, that trying to see this from the perspective of a patient, uh, which is that they want that joined up that those joined up conversations. So I think this is really where secondary prevention, uh, we, we really want to see a, a greater emphasis on that. And secondary prevention is the opportunity for all healthcare professionals to say what can they do when they have somebody in front of them who's, who's a person to, to take those opportunities uh, to, to think about smoking cessation and to think about the range of options that we have. So using vaping as a, as a bridge to quitting, but also some of the, the other methods. We've seen this particularly, for example, in pregnancy, uh, where we see inequalities across the country and where we may need a, sort of a range of approaches to, to work with pregnant women so that we can really see a focus in that, in that such an important area, as you'll know from, from your work. Okay. Thank you. Um, my second question is on a slightly different topic, so just say, um, we know that there is an increasing number of children experiencing gender dysphoria. Um, we know that there's an increasing number of children experiencing gender dysphoria. We know that there are spiralling waiting lists. These children are waiting an unacceptably long time for a medical, uh, uh, professional medical assessment from these uh, expert clinics. And last summer, 
Uh, Dr. Hilary Cass essentially said that the Tavistock Clinic, the only clinic for this um, specific specialism, wasn't essentially fit for purpose, and she um, recommended it was closed. The, there has been a consultation on an interim service guideline, but at the moment, these two new clinics that are supposed to open in the spring, the consultation's finished, we haven't heard much from government. So what is being done to both ensure these children are getting better care uh, and the waiting lists are coming down? Um. Oh, and also, just to follow up on that, how are you making sure that the people who ran the clinic before so badly are not put in charge of running the new ones as well? So, in t taking the latter point first, I think one of the, the best ways of addressing that is far greater transparency. I think one of the concerns with what happened there previously, and uh, and my uh, colleague, the, the Minister of Equalities, has spoken out about the concerns, was the lack of transparency in terms of what was happening. Uh, and the concerns in terms of the advice and the decisions often children at a very young age uh, were taking. Uh, so I think in terms of the concerns around those that were involved previously, uh, part of that is being much more transparent uh, in terms of uh, what actions were taken uh, and how people are held to account uh, for that. Uh, I think more generally we need to be cautious uh, in terms of what decisions uh, very young children are taking. Uh, and at what stage of life uh, that is. Uh, and I think uh, ensuring that we empower the patient but reflect uh, the stage of life they are before decisions are taken from which it's hard to return. So on the interest of transparency, there was a consultation started and uh, completed on the 4th of December. The clinics are due to open in, September, in, sorry, in uh, April 2023, so that's not very long from now. Are you confident that those new clinics will be opened by then? Um, I will have to write back to you in terms of the timing of when the clinics are opening. Yeah, so I mean, just to be clear, I mean, this is an NHS programme of reform um, that uh, it, uh, it's the, um, uh, the NHS that will, is implementing the, uh, uh, the CAS review. So we'll get you an update um, uh, from the NHS on what their uh, current timelines and plans are. I think, Lucy, do you want to add? So, so this is a really, uh, this is an area where it's clear that the evidence base for prescribing treatments has been uncertain. And so we are actively working uh, from the research side to work with the NHS uh, uh, England to look at how we offer evidence-based care mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that we've got, um, we, we will typically use a whole range of clinical research op options, including randomised control trials, which is, we've seen how they worked in COVID when we had uncertainty over the best treatments, uh, and also to be very clear about the collection of outcomes and understanding, uh, particularly not just the short-term outcomes, but, but investing in, in collecting the longer term outcomes. This isn't just the UK, this is an area of, of uncertainty on an international basis. Um, and so I think we're going to be leaders in, in how we approach this going forward. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, my, final, my final question was right. about, was come, about the dentistry. You, should we come back to dentistry? I just wanted to get the mental health piece in before we take the, uh, the half time oranges. Um, uh, uh, or a quarter time oranges, imagine if we had them, uh, and then we'll come back to dentistry because that's a, that's a really important point and I'll let you sharpen those questions. Uh, James thanks, Morris on thanks. mental health. Um, just coming back to the, the mental health plan that mm. you mentioned, um, so midway through last year the government announced a consultation on a 10 year mental health plan, so wh why did you abandon that? Well, we're putting significant more funding into mental health, um, so 2.3 billion more a year by 24-25, so the significant funding uh, is going in. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work to evaluate the measures that have been taken to date, and you may have seen that there was some very positive evaluation in terms of the interventions we've been making through the schools programme, um, on which the data looks um, positive in terms of the effectiveness. Uh, of that. We've got more than a quarter of schools now uh, within uh, that programme and I think there's been a recognition and something the committee as a whole has recognised in the past that often mental health um, uh, pressures accumulate at a very young age uh, and so the, the importance of prevention before the age of 15. Why no distinctive mental health plan? Why, why, why have you made the decision to fold it into the, 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 the major condition strategy? Uh, notwithstanding your comments about suicide prevention, um, because 
I mean, during the coalition government, the, go the government had, for the first time, brought in a five-year plan for mental health. Mm -hmm. That sent a very strong signal, not only to patients, but the mental health community, yeah. that for the first time, mental health was being taken seriously in terms of moving towards parity of esteem between physical and mental health, and it acted as a way of galvanizing action in relation to the focus on mental health. So one of the concerns is that um, abandoning a 10-year plan for mental health sends quite a bad signal um, that that aspiration to achieve parity has been abandoned or been downgraded. No. So, so firstly, the financial commitment is there. Secondly, uh, obviously, I can't preempt fourth session legislation, but the committee will be familiar with the fact that the House of Lords has been looking at pre-legislative mm -hmm. uh, scrutiny in terms of the uh, mental health bill and perhaps as a signal to the committee the fact that I was uh, discussing that with Baroness Buscombe last week uh, indicates uh, perhaps the direction of travel if I mm. don't go any further than that in terms of trying to preempt whether there will be legislation or not but but obviously they're there. Um, just in terms of and I think there is a danger if I can be um, so bold. Um, when I was in the cabinet office, I um, had responsibility for science at one stage and discovered we had over 60 strategies across government for science and technology. Uh, and I think there's sometimes a danger for people to confuse a, a strategy with necessarily the delivery on the ground. And what we're doing with the major conditions is we've got the commitment in terms of funding, we've got more evaluation in terms of assessing what works, we're testing where we can use innovation more, and I flagged this in the House, one of the uh, areas where I was quite rightly challenged from the opposition benches was how do we support people before they go into a mental health crisis, and I gave an, ex an example of how we can use digital much more to empower the patient there, uh, and we should be looking at conditions much more in the round, and that is what the mental health uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the major conditions paper. But I, I think it would be a mistake to think having a plethora of strategies mm -hmm. is necessarily the best way to deliver. The, yeah. so just on that, so there was a, a consultation done last year which I think did raise a lot of expectation that the, that the government was taking mental health seriously. A lot of people put in um, quite you know, good submissions. So what's what are you going to do to make sure that those submissions get taken into account in the major condition strategy and that mental health doesn't just become some kind of subset uh, given the other priorities that um, you currently have? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I mean you're spot on. Uh, to, um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, we have to avoid uh, exactly what you uh, say. I mean, all that information is with the department and with the uh, NHS and will be built into policy uh, making. But what we're really describing here, and I'll come back to something the Secretary of State said earlier, uh, is you just have a tension in health policy between treating conditions and treating the person. Mm -hmm. um, now, really great health policy does both, and it's come out in the debate we've had. Do you have a, you know, a, a, a a condition-specific strategy, or do you have a person-specific strategy? Now, as I say, clearly you want both. I understand that, but the, yeah. the issue for mental health, so I'll give yeah. you an example. Stephen Powers the, made, uh, did a clinically-led review yeah. two years ago into, uh, and made some recommendations about waiting times and access standards for access to mental health services. Yeah. Now, since he did that review, yeah. it's fair to say nothing has been done in relation to waiting times and access standards that he was recommending. And previous to that, there was a big battle to actually get any agreement on waiting times and access standards. So my concern is that with the downgrading, although you know we could we could yeah. argue about whether it is a downgrading, means that those battles become even more difficult when we're talking about mental health because of the prioritization around cancer and other mm. prioritized physical health issues that it becomes even more important that mental health gets its own space. Yeah, no, I'd agree completely, except for the word downgrading. Um, I don't accept that either we or the NHS uh, has done uh, uh, any uh, downgrading. Now, we have got, um, post, the, uh, post the last piece of uh, legislation, um, a new vehicle uh, for integration, the heart of which 
is let's look at the person um, as well as the uh, condition. So the test of um, uh, your, uh, your description of what needs to happen uh, is going to be does the ICS and um, ICB process properly prioritise mental health in exactly the way? And the reason you have to do it that way is, obviously, I mean, just like there is a big overlap between people with different uh, major conditions, the overlap between people with mental health conditions and physical health conditions uh, and the self-reinforcing nature of those two, you know, you have a musculoskeletal problem, you can't work, you're in serious pain, that makes your mental health work. You know, we've all seen those examples. You know, that's one of the integration issues that the ICS ICB system is designed to take. Now, where I completely agree with you is in that approach that the government and the NHS is taking, it's very, very important that mental health doesn't uh, uh, get lost and is hardwired into general thinking about health as opposed to, we've done all these things, and oh yes, now we need to do some mental health okay. on the side. Just so, so I think your I think test the, is I think exactly the, bell, the right the one. The bell is about to, uh, and I just got one question. What, Secretary of State, you, you said that you had been discussing the Mental Health Act reform mm -hmm. following the, 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 the committee's report. So is it your expectation that we will have legislation um, um, brought forward in relation to the reform of the Mental Health Act in this uh, next session of Parliament? So, well, as I just alluded to, to the chair, it's a cross-government decision in terms of legislation for the fourth session, but we welcome the report of the Joint Committee, uh, and we're obviously considering that, and that's what partly why I was uh, meeting with uh, the Baroness in terms of discussing that. But just to, to further both on that and, and to the perm sex points, uh, I think if you look at the show notes, uh, when you say, are we uh, showing commitment to mental health, uh, I'll just give you two examples, one from this week, the commitment to mental health ambulances. Uh, you can see that was a key uh, priority. I think that will make a, a material difference. Um, uh, and secondly, the rollout three years ahead of schedule of 24-7 helplines, all providers have done in terms of mental health. So you're right, if one goes back to the previous Prime Minister, Prime Minister May had a big commitment in terms of mental health that was then reflected in the long-term plan. The Chair is very familiar with the discussions that were held uh, at that time. Uh, and what you can see just from the announcement this week is there is a commitment to mental health. Obviously, the discussion on legislation and the Mental Health Act and making sure we have legislation fit for the 21st century is part of that. But you can see also the funding commitment that's been made. And obviously, in terms of when you say the last couple of years, that has been within the context of the pandemic, which has had a short-term impact on some of the, the longer-term yeah. plan yeah. Thanks. objectives. Thanks, All right, thank you very much. Uh, we can't preempt four session bills. Spoken like a former whip, <laughs> Secretary of State, if I may say, um, and I was there with you. Um, right, uh, Lucy Allen, uh, backlog. Thank we'll you start very much. and then we'll finish. Um, when I represent a constituency <coughs> that has one of the poorest performance um, metrics across every single measure. Um, and I'm very grateful indeed for the um, urgent and emergency care plan that you've announced because that will make a massive difference to my constituents. But what I would like to ask you is what is your department doing to tackle these huge disparities where, for example, if you, um, if you live in London, you will have been getting orthopaedic care right throughout COVID, but if you live in Shropshire, you, um, it hasn't restarted at the Princess Royal in Telford. There's been no orthopaedic surgery since before COVID. Now, we have these huge disparities mm right across the patch, um, whether it's access to GPs or um, maternity care in a particular area. Does your department look at poorly performing trusts, areas that are not delivering care to, to patients and work with them? I mean, so this is beyond special measures. This is ta identifying and tackling that massive disparity. Because it can't be right that it depends where you live, how you are able to access care. Yes, so I, th I think there's a number of things within that question, if I may. I think um, there's programmes like the Get It Right First Time, which is looking at how we redesign pathways to enable patients to get the right care, how we empower patient choice, which is something that we're looking at within 
the electors. But where, well, as you know, your your trust, I think, is in um, Operation Framework Four, which means it does get national support for reasons that you and I, I think, offline have talked about in the past in terms of the challenges that Shrewsbury and Telford has faced. Um, I would slightly widen it from just the trust, uh, and what we need to be doing is much more looking at the system-wide response. Uh, the integrated care boards became operational in July. Um, I don't think it's right that every trade-off on risk should be taken by me or by the PermSec or the department centrally. We should be devolving more, uh, but I think the flip side to that is we should have greater transparency on the data so we can particularly target variation in performance. So we shouldn't be second-guessing all the decisions we should devolve, and the Hewitt Review is tasked with uh, looking at how we best do that, and then within that, what is best done at a regional level and what is best done at a national level, and within that, there'll always be a place for some national support programmes for those areas that are under particular challenge, and that's the nature of the sport that Shrewsbury and Telford has been receiving. Yeah, um, and if I, if, if, if I could add, we, if we had Sir Jim Mackey, who runs this programme for the NH, uh, NHSE, sitting here, this is what he talks about. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the, um, uh, uh, the elective care plan, I mean, I, I don't think there's any dispute that those are the right actions. Um, I think you know, they've got wide support across the uh, NHS and clinicians uh, and, uh, uh, and et cetera. So, it, so we're very confident that we and the NHS have a clear plan. And what he talks about is how do you drive that in local circumstances, in that difficult place, um, you know, which is not performing. And that is his laser-like uh, uh, laser focus in exactly the way the Secretary of State said. So, that is not to say that it's easy. I mean, and as we were discussing before, the difference between we've got a great plan yeah. and one more elective surgery that wasn't happening before happens in a hospital in a constituency, that is the tough bit. But as I say, if you look at what Jim and his colleagues do every day, um, it is exactly on your uh, question, I mean, yeah. what the Secretary of State described. I mean, it's about described. making sure that the, the worrisome trusts are on your, on your radar. Yeah. So if I could move on to maternity care, Again, back to my local experience. The just, just so on that, I can be absolutely sure that where so 15 trusts were responsible for more than half of ambulance delays, for example, in the summer. Um, we have massive variation in theatre utilisation, so we should be aiming for 85 percent. We don't have that quite often. The theatres take too long to get going or finish too early. Very so those meet me and my exactly. Shropshire colleagues. So those are the sort discussing. of things that we will be looking to push on. Yeah. Okay. Of that thought on maternity, uh, sitting suspended while we. Vote and then we will resume. Order, order. So two votes. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 The proceeding is currently suspended.
The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended.
about to ask services. We were talking about regional disparities in, in performance and I wondered if I could open that up to look at uh, maternity mm. care mm. because this year we had the publication of the Ockenden report um, and that was unfortunately very many years in, in coming to light. Um, so I'd like to ask you what your department is doing to ensure where we have failing services that they are identified quickly and that these disparities are um, evened out so that we can have a national health service right across the country. maternity services prevent that harm uh, so there has been that investment as well recognizing quite rightly the points that the committee has previously made when when looking at that so so i think there's been a serious issue there's recognition that improvements uh, need to be uh, made and i think the ockenden report is an extremely important report and it, it's one where the department has accepted those recommendations fully. If I, if I could just interject there, one big takeaway for me was the difficulty in getting people to take the concerns of families seriously. So I was a new MP back in 2015. I would be raising this with management, and there was a culture of, no, this is perfectly normal, this is what happens, nothing to see here. It was accountability issue, a culture of accountability that was really lacking. You know, why are these MPs asking questions? And I think we have moved forward, and we now have a fantastic ICS, I, ICB chair, uh, Simon Whitehouse, and a, and a great chief executive of the Hospital Trust. But there will be management like that in place today, elsewhere, who are not looking for signs that things are going wrong. And I just wondered what your department is doing to make sure that when it comes across your desk, warning signals flash straight up. Well, I think, again, part of it comes to the work we're doing on data transparency. Um, I think, so one of the things I'm very interested in is looking um, at the variation in performance, uh, looking at where similar trusts are producing different results. Uh, I think thinking about how we use technology to better assess um, large volumes of data. So the way artificial intelligence, for example, can identify patterns within data, which then allow for more targeted investigation. I think there's important lessons, and certainly I was very struck to it by the response to the women's health strategy, uh, where one of the, sort of the key themes that came through was a feeling of women's voices not being heard in a system, despite the workforce being predominantly uh, women, where the feedback was very clear, it was felt, it was designed by men for men, uh, and that was reflected in the women's health strategy around, for example, the, the one-stop shops and redesigning services in a more holistic way. And I think the same goes for maternity uh, in terms of looking at where there's patient safety incidents, how those are being reported, uh, how whistleblower concerns are being addressed. And I think anyone who recalls my role on the Public uh, Accounts Committee will know that I particularly championed the roles of whistleblowers, particularly in health uh, and stopping gagging clauses, because I think transparency is important in terms of picking up on where I think there is there a culture issues. within the NHS that needs to change. I think there's variation within the NHS, and, and what you see is some areas that are, are extremely good, and others where there's been persistent concerns. And I think the question is the speed at which those are identified, uh, and how quickly then measures are taken uh, to intervene. Yeah, if, if, if I mean, if I could add, I mean, I think you yeah. put your thing on a very important set of points. Uh, triangulation. So any safety system um, in any uh, environment, but particularly in health, it's no one thing. 
um, its duties of candour, its inspection, its in-trust systems, its patient voice, its whistle-blowing, its patient safety commission. And what you have to have is a sort of multiple system so that if one bit fails, so in your example, you know, the in-trust governance hasn't worked, there are multiple other ways of identifying the same thing. And if you look at the, the development of this, you know, particularly under um, uh, the, the current chancellor, who obviously made this a big... Uh, issue. That is what he's put in place and what we've built on is hopefully we are not reliant on any one thing to spot um, a, uh, a, a, a potential uh, problem. Now we ought to let Lucy say, given that this is your field of expertise, at least one okay, thing on I'd, this. With respect, Permit Secretary, we, we will decide who, who answers which question. Uh, do you feel you've had enough answers, Lucy? You've got something your, you'd like to oh, say. Just quickly. I'm speaking as a practicing briefly, consultant obstetrician. And I think you're right. I think when I talk to women every week in clinic, they want to, to have a safe mum at the end of pregnancy, a healthy baby, and they want that positive experience with respectful care. Mm. But when I see what our colleagues as healthcare professionals, mm. doctors, midwives, ambulance colleagues, they all, get, they all want to, to be part of that. And I think we want that, that real impetus towards that um, culture where, where we go to work to do an amazing job to make a difference. And, and we want the environment in which that can thrive. And what we've seen, it is, we've seen the reports and we're also seeing a real motivation through a whole range of, uh, of moves. Uh, but just not, not just the numbers, but also, as you say, the variation and how we, we also work to, to get that culture right. Thank you. This is, that's an interesting exchange. Thank you. Uh, right, Chris Green, ICSs, which is Secretary of State, you will know we are holding an inquiry, the original inquiry into ICSs. Uh, <laughs> uh, very much welcome. Uh, Patricia Hewitt's uh, help. Uh, Chris. Thank you. Uh, so you just say the integrated care system boards partnerships are key to driving up improvements in the National Health Service across England. Uh, health uh, and social care devolution uh, like this first came to Greater Manchester in 2016 as a mayoral responsibility. Was it a success? Um, I, I don't think the um, the Mayor of Manchester has been as successful as one would have hoped in uh, what has been devolved. Um, clearly there is a role, I think, for combined authorities in terms of what is the wider direction of travel is around integration. And I think there is a role for elected mayors, particularly in the public health space, to play a role in that integration. But what we're doing through the ICBs is allowing, and I come back to this point of a variation in performance. I think. If one looks commercially, I don't think most businesses would accept the level of variation that we tolerate or is tolerated within the NHS. Mm -hmm. And through the 42 ICBs and accepting that they are different demographics and different size and at different levels of maturity, but I think one of the things, the opportunities moving forward is to, to compare and contrast the performance of ICBs. Um, and that's not to say everyone should be similar to others, but to look at cohorts within those 42 where there are uh, comparisons that can be drawn uh, and look at how they're managing uh, the devolved powers uh, and how we compare and contrast that between them. So I think there is a role for the Mayor. I, I don't think with the, the pilots that uh, went to the Mayor of Manchester have been as successful as they should have been. Um, but what I'm very keen on is we have greater transparency so we can empower people to reach their own judgment. This, this must be um, uh, uh, quite frustrating because uh, not only was £450 million uh, transformation uh, money put into Greater Manchester, but it's also supposed to be, to a certain extent, um, uh, showing leadership to the rest of the country. This is a role model in which to follow. And so questions, and we look at the moment, and, and this is where the health social care could have, should have been brought together more effectively. It should have been role modelling that in Greater Manchester so other parts of the country could now be following. Yeah, and I think the, the wider area where... Um, I think what was behind the devolving uh, of greater health powers to Manchester, and there's other authorities, my own in Cambridgeshire uh, and Peterborough, uh, albeit that, as Mr Bristow will know, has just had a, a letter from government because that authority is failing. So it's probably not the best uh, model on which uh, to draw, but they also had some uh, opportunity in the health space. I think the wider direction is there is a role for greater integration, and clearly mayors, in terms of their interaction with local authorities, have a part to play. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly around public health, but more generally. And I think what we need to do in a system where in the past there's been too many silos, how do we take a more integrated approach? The right prism through which to do that is the ICBs. 
Uh, that allows then the committee, parliament, colleagues to have much more transparency, in particular the public, to have more transparency uh, around the relative performance. Uh, and I think that in turn will allow the public in Manchester to reach a better decision on the effectiveness of the powers that the mayor's had. We have, um, I think, 39 police authorities uh, across England. Last June, six of those were in special measures of one form or another. 42 integrated care boards, integrated care systems. If we can anticipate a similar rate of uh, failure or significant problems, what mechanisms, what levers do you have to part uh, an integrated care system and take action equivalent to that taken against those uh, police forces? Well, I think firstly, the, the lead on this from an operational performance point of view um, legally is NHS England. Uh, so that is why, and we touched on it in the context of Shrewsbury and Telford, through the operating framework, you have the different levels, so level three, uh, OF3, which is a sort of regional level of inter intervention, and level four, which is a national level uh, of intervention. Uh, I do think both ministers, but also members of parliament, uh, have a role to play, and one of the things I'm very keen to do is to empower parliamentary colleagues more through uh, giving transparency on the data, on their ICBs, uh, so that uh, members of parliament can be more engaged mm -hmm. in those conversations rather than perhaps being as on receive mode from health leaders, but actually a bit more um, uh, able to, to look at variation in performance and ask why their trust is in a different place uh, to others. Uh, of course, in terms of leadership more widely, uh, Mr. Green, you've got the messenger review that had the seven recommendations in terms of how we improve uh, leadership uh, across the NHS. And again, I think most people recognise there are some areas of outstanding leadership within the NHS, but there's others where uh, there's trusts that are troubled. But what I'm very keen to do is in those troubled areas that we set realistic objectives. Because sometimes in the past, uh, I remember United Lincolnshire a few years ago being an example of this, the chief exec kept being changed, but actually there were underlying difficulties of geography, of recruitment, of various things, which whoever the chief exec of the day was, were going to be very difficult in terms of managing. So what we've got to do is have greater transparency, set realistic objectives for the leadership team, uh, and then look at how we address the variation in performance. I, I appreciate the point about that democracy and that accountability locally, and just as a closing point uh, on this. Um, so the devo devolution to the mayor's um, I don't know whether that's an experiment that you're going to be pursuing in the future with the devolution agenda being uh, pursued more widely. Are you anticipating health devolution and mayoral responsibility over it in, in that sense to be carried on, or is that kind of drawn to an end now? No, I think DLUC have proposed some further uh, round three uh, devolution. That's more in the public health space. Uh, so the direction of travel is to devolve more. Um, personally, as I said earlier, I think you know, instinctively I want to devolve more uh, because I think risk should be best assessed closer to the ground. But I think the, the counter to that is you've got to have much more transparency in real-term data. Uh, and I think the more uh, visible, you're starting to see that through the Daily Telegraph tracker, the Spectator data tools. Uh, there's a number of tools now open source that actually weren't there two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we can uh, have transparency on data, but it's not simply a quantity of data, it's the quality of the data. So to what extent does it allow people to really understand what is happening with their health system? Uh, and I think that's the area where using technology, we can start to probe the variation in performance. And I think if we can have a serious push of getting uh, different areas to the upper quartile, that can be very significant in terms of the transformation. Thank you, Chris. Okay, different subject now, Secretary of State. Um, we're going to talk about pensions and visas. Martin Day. Thank you. So, <coughs> a bit concerned about, you, you know, I'm always going on about pensions and I raised it with you last week at, uh, at questions and at that stage you said discussions were ongoing and, and that sort of follows up to what you said in November. So, really what, I mean, and to be fair, I, I think probably the villain is the Treasury in this one, not, not the yourself. So, Hopefully we're on the same side, but what more are you planning to do to tackle the problem is really my question. Yeah. So, so firstly, I think, Mr Day, is to recognise that I think pensions is an important part of the debate, uh, and you're quite right. You know, Treasury has a, a material interest uh, in this. Uh, so there has been progress. Uh, so you'll have seen the, 
the flexibility in, and there's something that was started in COVID, the ability of people to, to return to the workforce whilst continuing to top up their pension. So that uh, flexibility was there. The, the rule that staff could only work 16 hours a week in the first month after retirement uh, has been flexed. Um, so there are the direction of travel in terms of recognising we need to be more flexible uh, on pensions. Uh, but it is something that I know my right of North London Chancellor is also looking at in the wider context, for example, of consultants uh, and, and the difficulty um, and I think the, the debates are, are well voiced in that regard. So those discussions are ongoing, but you can see there is a direction of travel and there's a number of flexibilities that have already been put in place. And I'm very grateful to hear that. When, when do you think I'll be able to tell the doctors that keep raising this with me what, what the answer is going to be? Well, um, I, I can't commit, Mr. Day, to a date for, I think, reasons that you would understand, uh, but these are areas that are, are discussed uh, within government and, and obviously um, are discussed with uh, Treasury colleagues. Yeah. Okay. Coming on to the impact that Brexit's had on, on the workforce, one of the areas that the Royal College of GPs has, has highlighted that 40% of GP trainees are international graduates, but that 49% have reported issues with the visa process and as a consequence, perhaps as many as 17% are thinking about leaving the UK altogether as a result. So what can, surely this must be something that can be done to streamline this process for the key workers that we need. Yep. So, well, I think there's two points within that. I think there's first, there is a recognition and, uh, across the committee in terms of the importance of, of recruitment, uh, and that is partly why government has committed to the workforce plan. We've committed to that being independently verified. Uh, and clearly more will be said on that. That's within the context of already recruiting more. So 4,700 more doctors. Uh, we're on track with our manifesto commitment for 50,000 nurses, over 30,000 uh, recruited, 10,500 more than last year. So we are recruiting more. You raise, Mr. Day, a perfectly valid point around visas. Uh, and again, that is something that I have discussed with my colleague, the Home Secretary. Um, and I think it's part of a wider discussion. So I am very keen with Home Office colleagues that the Department of Health and Social Care is constructive around how we work with the police on mental health. There's a very interesting pilot on mental health uh, in Hartlepool uh, where uh, we've seen significant reductions in police time uh, through working differently uh, with health care. So it's largely a historic reason, my understanding, as to why this sits more with the police when suicide was a a criminal offence. So I'm very keen that the Department of Health um, assist colleagues in the Home Office in terms of how we tackle some of the pressure on police time, on mental health, uh, and equally I'm very keen that the Home Office work with us uh, in terms of some of the visa challenges and those are discussions again that we're having. Well, that's, that's good to hear. Uh, I've quoted the Nuffield Trust a few times when I've, I've questioned you before so I've got enough, a different bit from them uh, today. They, they've found that the recruitment, obviously, of dentists and social care workers from the EU has been left, and their, their expression was uncompensated by the increased recruitment drives from the rest of the world. So clearly we've got, you know, a legacy of, in my opinion, a legacy from Brexit that's not filling the gaps that we need filled. How do we address that? Um, well, I think the two things within that. I think the issue on dentistry, and dentistry is an I something that is raised a lot by colleagues uh, across the House. The, uh, the central issue on dentistry, we've actually got 6.5% more dentists now than we did in 2010. And the issue is more the proportion of their time that is spent on NHS work rather than the overall number of, of dentists. Uh, obviously, there's, there's always a desire uh, to recruit more, but it, it's, it's, there is an increase in dentists as I say, the, the, the issues are around how we incentivise the NHS work. Your point in terms of EU recruitment and, and um, what we've done is level the playing field in terms of having the approach to recruitment across the world. We've seen an increase uh, in EU staff within the NHS, so those numbers uh, are up. In fact, I was just looking at our evidence again to the pay review body and, and the, you know, as part of that evidence, we've got the increase in EU recruitment, what we've seen is a much higher increase across the board in terms of international recruitment. So the proportion rise is much higher internationally than it is from the EU, but it's still um, the number of uh, staff in the NHS from the EU has also increased. Yeah, but one final question on a slightly different topic. Yesterday you made the announcement about the additional £1 billion in, in England. Is that new money or is that part of the £14 billion that was announced in the, the autumn statement? Well, the 14 billion is new money because it starts from April. 
So, so the 14.1, and, and that 14.1 is made up of the 6.6 .6 billion over two years to the NHS, and the 7.5 billion uh, for social care, which is the biggest ever increase in funding for social care. And I think actually is a tribute to the work that the committee itself has done, because certainly looking at evidence in the past, one of the very strong uh, flavours that comes through is the importance of integration between social care and health, uh, and what the Chancellor recognised in the autumn statement, that was it wasn't simply about funding the NHS with the 6.6 .6 billion, it was also about the social care funding, uh, and we may come on to discharge and the interaction with some of the pressures on A&E uh, and ambulance handover times, but a lot of that relates to the social care side. So, so that 1 billion is from the 14.1 billion, uh, but that will kick in from April of this year. Thank you. Almost perfectly, uh, but just before we do, um, just, just one in a Westminster Hall debate on the subject of visas for doctors. Um, a previous health minister committed to look at integrated care systems or primary care networks acting as umbrella sponsors for visas. I just wondered if you had anything to add on that or whether you could take that away and have a look at that for us. I'm very happy to take that away. Uh, I think I mean, in it's, principle, you, it's no the, reason well, why not. Not only that, but I think in, in principle, uh, subject to Home Office colleagues and, and discussing with them, but I chair as a, as a direction of travel within the social care sector, one of the things I'm very keen we explore is clearing houses. Mm. Because if you look at the social care market, you have a, a number of our big players covering around half of the market, but you have quite a long tail of very small providers who realistically will find it much more difficult to recruit internationally. But also you want to ensure the right safeguards are in place on things like modern slavery uh, in terms of recruitment of people as they come in to the UK. So one of the things that certainly on the social care side is thinking about how we approach immigration in, in different ways and use clearing houses uh, to better triage that uh, and put some wraparound uh, safety features into that. Uh, if there's opportunity to, to do similar uh, on the NHS side, then very open uh, to looking at that. And I know the chief uh, nurse, Ruth May, more generally has been looking at how we accelerate uh, international recruitment because we recognise the pressures the system's under now, and that's why we're ramping that up alongside the work that's going in the, into the medium and longer term with the workforce plan. Okay, very good. Thank you, Martin. So, Paul Blomfield. Thanks, Chair. And I was going to follow up on social care and will do, but I wonder if I could f first um, ask a question which kind of relates to the one of the crises within the uh, service at the moment, and that's in relation to staff across the board. Um, I was talking earlier to some of our colleagues from the ambulance service, um, and one of the things we were talking about was the problem with staff retention. Um, and they were telling me about younger members of the service in particular who are thinking of not sticking with the job um, because they couldn't afford to. Now, we know that retention um, is a problem with young doctors. Um, there was a report, I think, a couple of weeks ago which suggested that 42,000 nurses had voluntarily left in quarter two of last year. How far does this challenge of retention figure in your thinking when you're approaching the pay dispute? And how far do you think a settlement could play a big role in boosting morale and keeping people in those jobs? Well, so firstly, I think Mr. Bloomfield raised a very important point because I think retention is extremely important uh, uh, for several reasons. I think firstly, um, given the length of time it takes to train a clinician, and given the immediate pressures that we face, you can understand why it's far better to be able to retain uh, that clinical support rather than incur uh, both the time delay of training others, but also the cost of doing so. And indeed, that's part of the discussion with Treasury colleagues in the pensions debate, uh, is looking at some of the, the trade-offs uh, there. Um, so I think retention is extremely important. I think when looking at that, one needs to look at the total remuneration so on average across the NHS, uh, alongside basic pay, most, uh, the average uh, additional uh, income is 29% from overtime, uh, clinical excellence awards, um, antisocial working hours, and some of those other um, additional elements. That's the, the average across the piece. Um, if one looks also at the pension compared to the private sector, um, so for a nurse it's an extra 20%. 
that goes into their pension, that is obviously much higher than would be the case for many constituents in other. So I think in terms of considering retention, one of the issues in the context of the pay dispute is looking at the remuneration in total, not simply what the baseline pay is. Can I just push the Secretary to say something on that? Because that doesn't seem to be working at the moment, does it? I mean, that overall remuneration package isn't convincing people that they should stay. Do you not think that a pay settlement closer to the ambitions of the staff across the sector might be a factor in persuading more people to stay? Well, there's, there's pressures uh, on the workforce, as I said, I'll let the set come in, but the, the pressures because of the pressures of the pandemic, which is everyone recognises has created huge pressures on the system. There's wider pressures on the economy as a whole, which is why the Chancellor set out other fiscal support that apply to NHS staff as they do to other staff, such as with heating uh, costs. Uh, there's, there's pressures from inflation, which plays into people's food bills and other costs. Uh, and in terms of the wider government approach, getting the inflation down is actually hugely beneficial to the cost of living pressures uh, of NHS staff as for other staff. Uh, and of course, we are recruiting more uh, than are leaving. So there is the recruitment, but clearly the more staff we retain, given the time it takes to train people, then that is uh, an area that we're looking at. And obviously these are issues that the pay review body weighs up when looking in the round. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was going to add. It's, of course, key data for the independent pay review uh, body system is the uh, both the uh, recruitment and retention rates. That's one of the key things that they look at when they come to us uh, with their recommendations. Uh, the one I'd add to your list, and it fl flows from what the Secretary of State said, um, uh, return. So there is a general change in the labour market that because of lengthening careers, people don't stay in the same career for their entire time. So when I used to do education, um, there were lots more leavers from the teaching profession. There were also lots more returners, uh, to, um, and you were just seeing a change in the labour market. Now, because of the training in health, that is much more difficult. Um, and it's one of the things that we and the professions actually need to think about. If you're not going to be in the same profession for your whole career, how does that GP who wants to come back and be a GP, how do we get them back into the labour force quickly, not going back to the beginning of training, likewise for all the other professions. And it is a particular challenge which we're talking with the Royal Colleges and others uh, about, is if that's that the way the world's what was, going. What I was specifically yeah. trying to explore was the relationship between pay and retention. Yeah, well, as, me, I, as, me, a, as I say, the key bit of that is the pay review bodies. There's an absolutely crucial starting piece of data that the pay review bodies use and, uh, uh, and feeds into their conclusions. Could I just add one, which is a non-pay, but I think is relevant, because there's one area of common ground with trade union colleagues when I discussed with them. So if you look at the number of, of uh, take nurses as opposed to paramedics, but the leaver rate of 11.5%, but the number actually leaving the LMC register was 3.5%. So what's interesting about that discrepancy is, is what we can do around more flexibility for staff, particularly where people are going through different stages. They may have caring responsibilities at one stage or at the later stage of their their career, how can we offer more flexibility in roles? And that's something that trade union colleagues um, certainly said to me that was uh, of interest. So pay is a factor. Uh, as I say, I think one looks not just at the, the baseline, but also the additional pay and the wider remuneration on things like uh, pension. But it's also looking at the estate, the tech, the non-pay benefits, the flexibility, the e-rostering and things like that, because all of those are factors. And for paramedics, actually, interestingly, and it's, it's only an anecdote, so I won't say this applies to all uh, areas, but when I was visiting one station uh, recently, their frustration with the, the length of handover delays, they said, was a greater issue for them than pay. That wasn't to say pay wasn't, wasn't a factor, but actually in terms of morale, they were hugely frustrated with the handover delays. I mean, we could pursue this a lot further, but I do want to uh, return to um, my original questions, which were around social care. Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, I think our politics generally has failed to grapple with the issue, but we had a government come in in 2019 which made a big commitment and said there was a plan to deal with the crisis in social care. Now, it turned out it wasn't. It was a plan to deal with a niche issue within that, which is the payment regime, and even that's fallen apart. Um, I accept that more money, and you've talked about it earlier, has been put in to patch up and deal with the sort of crisis interaction with the hospital 
costs. Um, but uh, is there any work going on in the department to actually develop a plan, the sort of paradigm shift that might enable us to have the sort of care system that could meet the changing needs of the country um, and the current needs of the country? Yeah, so, so I think, first, there's a huge amount of work going on in the department. I think there's been a step change in focus on social care in recent years, certainly compared to uh, previously. I mean, when I was first in the department, we didn't have social care as part of the department, and that was something that the now Chancellor, then Health Secretary, pushed very hard to have included uh, in the department with, uh, in conjunction with the Permanent Secretary. Um, and I think since then there has been an increased trajectory of focus on so social when, care. When, when might we see the plan? Well, I, so I think there's a huge amount of the 7.5 billion pounds building on the money that's gone in. So, for example, the the sort of area where we're seeing significant improvements is around the reporting of data, which is still um, there's areas that need to improve uh, on that. But we need to have much better uh, data uh, on the social care uh, in order to see which interventions are having the, the best impact on discharge. So, are we going to see? A a plan for social care before the general election, do you think? It depends what you mean by uh, a, a, a plan. A, we have, I, I guess I mean we have a long-term plan. plan. A, a, an attempt to fix a broken system, to ensure that we are um, able to recruit, train, support uh, care workers properly, um, and that we're able to meet domiciliary and residential care needs. Mm -hmm. well, Literally yesterday, I set out a plan in terms of urgent emergency care, where a central component of that plan, indeed the Minister of for Social Care did the media round on the plan, which indicates how involved she was in our work uh, within the UEC, uh, where if you want to tackle pressures in terms of the emergency department and ambulances, actually tackling discharge and looking at how we better integrate the social care element into the pressures in the NHS is central to that. The deferment that you uh, mentioned with Mr Bloomfield relating to the charging reform, I think is a separate issue to uh, how we get the right support in for workforce, uh, how we get the right data, how we get the integration between social care uh, and the NHS. And I think there's already a huge amount of work in the summer. I when I looked at, for example, the Jean Bishop Integrated Care Centre bringing social care and health together, as up in Blackpool uh, a week or so ago, looking at how they are bringing that. So there's a huge amount of work going on on that. I mean, I, I accept there's a lot of work going on. We talk about it regularly mm. in, in my area in terms of the integration. But actually, you're integrating um, with a basically inadequate social care system. You know, and, and it just wondered where um, the vision was in terms of taking that uh, forward. But um, am I running out of time? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the Good thing, anticipation. Now, the thing, the <laughs> thing I would add. Now, obviously, there is the big question that uh, political parties debate the entire time about the division between what's been there since the beginning of the NHS national free service versus a local means tested service. I will leave that debate to you. Because of that debate, it is very easy to underplay. Um, the amount of reform that is uh, going on in social care. So the last uh, legislation that we passed uh, created a much clearer accountability system for social care and provision of data, uh, and for the first time, the inspection uh, of, um, uh, of commissioning. Uh, during COVID, as you know, we took a much more proactive uh, approach to uh, uh, the management of uh, uh, social care and the leadership of it, and that continues uh, post-COVID. We are very active on the recruitment uh, questions that we were uh, discussing uh, uh, earlier. Uh, we're doing quite a lot around the career structure of social care and trying to give uh, social care workers that sort of career ladder, which is part of the recruitment things that you have raised. And then there is the additional investments that um, the uh, uh, the uh, 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 the Chancellor uh, has made in the, uh, uh, in the social care system. Now, that adds up to, actually, a pretty comprehensive uh, set of reforms to social care to tackle the issues that uh, you've been describing. Does it affect that basic dynamic that you were describing at the beginning? No, that's clearly a big legislative uh, societal question about how we run the two uh, services. So what we have been focused on, and it comes back to Mr Green's questions on um, uh, ICSs, ICBs, uh, is how do we pragmatically drive integration within the current 
legislative framework, and that is all about the ICB ICS uh, system. But it's now, also to to, I, you know, to to back up my colleague. It's also about the funding long term for yeah. it. You know, let, let's remember the Theresa May government admittedly during a general election campaign, which was yeah. not the brightest idea, uh, launched the, the policy of people's homes being brought yeah. into that. Um, and then the Johnson government put the 1% on national insurance, which the trust government took away. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, and, and the answer was that, well, it would be funded by general taxation. Well, and, and, it, and it is being uh, right. in the numbers that the Chancellor have announced. Now, and it's very important, and uh, I think, um, uh, uh, you, you were drawing this distinction, uh, the reforms both that you're describing in the general election and the deal not reforms are about what is the right distribution between the state and the individual of the same sized uh, allocation. Now that's a very, very important question, but a lot of the issues about the day-to-day -day service is about how much is well, the Well, it, is, it is a very important question, yeah. but it's a bit yeah. like the West Lothian question of our times, isn't yes. it? Because no. nobody well, seems to be able to answer it. Well, I mean, you know, the, the public no. didn't want the dementia tax, uh, yeah. using inverted commas for yes. Hansard's benefit. No, so they didn't want, the, you know, many yeah. people in Parliament, and many people outside didn't want an, a 1% increase yeah. in national insurance to pay for it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't yeah. see huge polls suggesting that the public yeah. want great income tax rises right now to pay for the general taxation change to it. So it is a big societal question. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as Tandale uh, found well, with his question, it wasn't answered. Well, and um, uh, to, uh, that goes exactly with what I'm saying to you. There is that big question, which is a matter of politics and finance and taxation. And there are a set of reforms that we can get on with right now that I have just described, which are about making it better. Yep. Now, we are focused on the second question. Of course, that first question uh, sits on the table. But in answer to your question, what is going on, the department and our local yes. government colleagues You're doing are what you focused can, but you can't on... Fix. Sorry? You're doing what you can, but you can't fix the scale of the Well, it depends what you mean by fix. Um, uh, if, if, if we're saying, can we improve the current system so that mm. both care workers get a better deal and the people that they serve get a better deal, that is, of course, a matter, as you say, of recruitment, of investment, of the reforms we're doing. That doesn't necessarily help you answer your bigger question. Uh. Um, but nevertheless, as I say, I think we are frequently in danger of underplaying the amount of work being done in the social care sector, because that big question, yeah. as you say, has dominated no, no, the debate. No, we are, we, are, we are full of big questions here. That is, uh, that is <laughs> one of the things we do. Um, so sort of in this sequence, if you like, Paula Hamilton is going to continue the care questions, okay. weren't you? Okay. And then I might just ask Rachel Maskell to ask about retention, and then there's some other bits that we might come back to later. But Paulette, do you want to continue the care and questions from, from Paul? Rachel or Correct. Oh, yeah, right, you, you, right, you right, next. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, thank you. Can I, uh, I'd like to start by thanking you because you know something: the extra money given to areas like Birmingham actually did increase our capacity bedwise. So I'd like to say for Birmingham and Solihull, that system, it did actually increase the bed capacity. Saying all of that, um, <laughs> I feel like we should stop now. All that but, I'm afraid. Oh. Yeah. Let me be, keep it simple. The money um, you've also promised quite a lot of money for next year, but it still doesn't meet the gap. And so for the question I'd like to ask is, you've asked local authorities that they need to top up. The question is, what if they're not able to do so? What then happens going forward? In terms of the sort of contribution in terms of local authorities. Yeah. So, well, firstly, we've got the, the 2.8 billion uh, next year. And, there's obviously conversations with local authorities in terms of how that is allocated uh, and ensuring that we uh, make the case with DLUC colleagues, uh, which I've obviously already been doing, in terms of the prioritisation of, uh, of tackling uh, discharge, having the right domiciliary care packages in place, with local authorities looking at what uh, additional uh, revenue they raise and what they spend on the other competing priorities that they have. But in terms of, uh, of the funding, I think people can see the interaction between uh, what is happening in domiciliary care and what is happening within the hospitals. And that's why uh, I think there's a very strong case to, to target that 2.8 billion onto the discharge side, 
because that in turn relieves the pressure on the hospital. So, so those are conversations we have with, with DLUC colleagues uh, in terms of um, the allocation of that funding. Uh, and part of the conversation on data is also to give more visibility to that as well. Right, so my second point is we still, um, even with the extra funding, we haven't got the additional staff that we actually need at this moment in time. So the question is, um, we, we, we don't have an urgent workforce plan in place at the moment. You've talked earlier, so I'm not going to go over what you've already said. The dates keep slipping. Will, will part of the solution be that nation, the national staff plan, it'll be run by ICBs, or will it remain a national thing? Well, the, the workforce plan document that we're bringing forward is a, is a document from NHS England uh, that will be uh, produced, um, uh, so it's being led by them, not by individual <coughs> ICBs. But on the wider point around the workforce and how do we have uh, the workforce to deliver on what was set out to the House uh, yesterday. I think that the key point is we need to look differently than simply having hospitals as magnets for more and more activity. Mm -hmm. What we have to do is more work upstream on demand management, particularly around the frail elderly, rather than them having to come to the emergency department. And we need to do more work at the other end in terms of uh, patients being able to go home sooner, which is what most patients want because they would, uh, on the whole, prefer to recover at home, but they want the safety net, the clinical safety net, and knowing there's ongoing supervision. So there's uh, ongoing clinical support, and that is what the work on the virtual wards of the sort that Watford and others have been trialling has shown. So, so it's about working in a more smart way, uh, thinking around where is the best place uh, for the patient to be treated. So let me give you an, an example. Um, at the moment, quite often you would find a patient who is solely on the ward because they need three antibiotics a, a day. And so they need to be on the ward to receive those three antibiotics. Well, we know that um, there's equipment now which will enable someone with one home visit to give them a, a more continual dose of those antibiotics so they can recover at home and have their antibiotics without having to be on the ward simply to wait for their three doses of antibiotics. So it's thinking innovatively about how we use our workforce in a smarter way is thinking about what are the roles that nurses are currently doing, which sometimes can be freed up, some of the administrative burden. So when I went to Maidstone, for example, uh, previously nurses had spent a lot of time phoning around looking for where the beds were. They've now brought a, an e-bed management system in with barcodes, so as soon as the bed is ready to be cleaned, it barcode is scanned, the porters, the cleaners are notified. As soon as they're finished, it's scanned, the control centre knows that bed is available and what that has done is it shifted that work away from the nurse and allows the nurse to focus on what they're trained to do which is the clinical side and not be distracted as much on the administrative side so so it's thinking about how we work in different ways uh, and the control centers the virtual wards more work upstream more work downstream are all examples of how we can then deliver those services in the right place so my final point, then I'll pass on because somebody else is going to cover what you have just talked about. I absolutely agree with you about um, the fact that we need to work smarter. The problem is, Steve, we haven't got the numbers in the system to work smarter. Social care is buckling. We, whether we do social care in the care homes or we do social care in people's homes or we just get friends and relatives to do the caring role, it is buckling at the moment. And the point I'm saying is the ambulance staff that are sitting behind you, they are feeling the pressure from the backlog. You've got nurses that are feeling the pressure on the wards, as, as you've just talked about. You do, you've got doctors. You've got all the health professionals feeling the pressure. And I'm going to go back to the plan. It's OK to say we've got to work smarter. But how are we going to bring those people in that if this, if we are going to work smarter, we're going to have to, no matter how we try, increase the numbers of bodies that are on the ground helping us at different levels to get the job done? So, firstly, I, I agree we need uh, additional workforce, and that's what we're putting in place. We've got 4,700 more doctors than last year. We've got 
Uh, we're on track with uh, nursing to hit the 50,000 target that we set out in the, man uh, the manifesto, over 30,000 recruiters. So we are hiring more. There's more people working in the NHS than ever before. But it's also around how we then think of, uh, about um, people operating in the way that best fits their clinical skills. So what are the administrative roles that we can take off people so that they can focus on things? How do we get people, as the saying goes, operating at the top of their license? So thinking around how we maximise where people have had significant investment in their training, how we make the most of that and empower them to do more. Uh, so an area I know the committee's looked at in the past is around pharmacy and how we do more with pharmacies where we have people that are very well trained who can do uh, a wider range uh, of roles uh, and so there's opportunities there. So, so it's thinking around the workforce in the world. I'm very keen, and the Perm Sec touched on this earlier, um, around having a more clear ladder between roles, so from social care into the NHS. Of course, there's a, a place for international recruitment as well, uh, and we're increasing international recruitment to bring more people in uh, as well, particularly on the social care side. So we are increasing the numbers through different uh, channels. We've got 3,000 paramedics being trained a year, so we're increasing there. 40% more paramedics now than in 2010. So we're increasing the numbers, but I think we can all accept that the demand is also increasing and that's why we've got to look at the major conditions paper and treating people who have got multiple conditions. It's why we've got to look at the technology side, but we've also got to look at how we get people operating at the top of their licence as well. I'll stop you at that stage. Thank all right. you, Thank, thank you, Paula. I, I enjoyed your disarming start. To <laughs> something we could all learn from, uh, which Rachel is now going to show the brilliant example of uh, in a, a, just a brief exchange about retention, which is one of the points you want to raise. We'll come back to some others later, but retention following on from what Paul was discussing. Thank you ever so much. And it, it does feed into pay as, as well. Um, 133,500 NHS staff who should be in their uniforms doing their job and they're not there. So how are you going to retain the people at the moment who are really broken, who are clearly um, facing that retention crisis, who are not motivated by what you're saying because they're having to deal with the day-by-day -day crisis, which is crushing them. How are you going to address that issue right now? Because we seem to be in the spiral, and unless injection is put in that, then that spiral will continue to escalate. Well, I think there's a number of things. I think, firstly, uh, in terms of pay, uh, that is through the evidence to the pay review body and the point that the Perm Sec raised earlier in terms of how those pressures on recruitment and retention, uh, the pressure on inflation, those issues are balanced by the pay review body because pay uh, is obviously a central part of this debate. Uh, so that is, is part of it. It's also looking at, as Mrs. Hamilton has just set out, some of the wider pressures uh, and how we then uh, look system-wide at how we address that. So the frustration within the ambulance service that I hear very clearly around uh, handover delays uh, how we tackle that, and that's why we set out a comprehensive plan, both putting in the extra capacity that we were just talking about in, in the context of Birmingham, that has helped immediately in terms of the pressures uh, this winter, but also look at the plan that I set out yesterday in terms of putting more resilience into the system for next year through the urgent and emergency care plan. Um, but it's looking also across the piece at the pressures on electives. That's why we've got the elective recovery plan. We hit the first key milestone of that in the summer and it's also looking at primary care where there's also significant weights and we've got a primary care plan that we're coming on to. So I think there is a, an element for pay but there's also an element in terms of the non-pay uh, pressures within the system and that's looking at a whole range of interventions and the recovery plans give a good flavour of that. But the pay element isn't working because we've got staff out on strike right now because they're saying simply they cannot survive on the, the pay they're on at the same time when they're working extraordinary additional hours on top of their paid hours and giving everything they have over the last few years to the NHS. So to address the issue of pay when it's meant to balance recruitment, retention and motivation, whilst in theory that is the practice, the reality is very different. So what else can you do? I recognise the circumstances have changed over the last year, which means surely the approach needs to change. So what are you going to do about that? Well, part of the evidence to the pay review body is they weigh in the round uh, those changes to which uh, you allude. But these are not simply uh, challenges that we face with the workforce in England. 
Uh, we see very similar challenges with strikes in Wales. We've seen similar challenges in Scotland. The French healthcare system is experiencing strikes. Uh, around the globe, the Canadian system has been under huge pressure. The pandemic has had massive pressure on healthcare systems, uh, and these are manifesting themselves through uh, difficulties across the piece, particularly across the United Kingdom. So this isn't simply an England-only phenomenon, but that also sits in the wider reality that there's cost of living pressures that are not confined to the health sector. That's why the strikes in the education sector, there's strikes in other sectors uh, as well. So you know, these issues need to be looked in the round in that as a result of the war in Ukraine and the pandemic costs, there are wider cost of living pressures. Those are felt by health staff, uh, but they're also felt by staff in other areas, and that's part of the cross-government decision. I obviously make the case for health, because that's my job within government, to make that case on behalf of the NHS. But other departments are also saying that it's not simply a health pressure. Their areas, their staff, are also facing cost of living pressures. And we've got 165,000 vacancies in social care as well. And we can all, uh, I'm sure if we sat down, we would have the same analysis. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Is it? Are you saying this is above your pay grade, that this is now a matter for the Treasury to resolve? Because um, until we get a resolution, we're just going to see that spiral ever increase. Well, I think there's a number of things. First, we're putting evidence into the pay review body as part of that process. And, but that hasn't you know, worked, well, has it? Got as I say, this is not simply the, the government that thinks the pay review body is the best way to, to look at these issues in the round. So does uh, the, the opposition as well, or at least the opposition uh, front bench has, has said the same. But it's not simply that that we're doing. We'll also bring forward our recovery plans, recognising that the system's been under very significant pressure. That's what I set out to the House, both on the first day back after Christmas, the £250 million responding to the immediate pressures we'd seen with the spike in flu and COVID over Christmas. We're recruiting more staff. Uh, that's why we've got uh, the, the extra recruitment on nurses, on, on the paramedics in training, the extra doctors that are being recruited. Uh, we're looking at some of the non-pay issues, like pensions, which Mr Day surfaced, and looking at what flexibilities we can have there. So there's a range of issues and I think the, the honest position is to recognise that this is not simply a pressure on the English NHS, it's something the Welsh, the Scots and others are also facing, as, as are health systems across the globe. Mm -hmm. so like with respect, that's bit. not resolving the dispute, and yeah. at the moment the, the staff need a resolution, and I'm, I'm searching to hear how you're going to achieve that. Well, we're discussing with them, as I say, there's the, the pay element, uh, and we believe the government's position is the best way to deal with that is through the pay review body that process but there's also there's also a number of things we can do on the non-pay side and indeed the committee's touched on a number of those around some of the flexibilities we can explore some of the uh, the workforce pressures that are being experienced and how we maximize the opportunities there but sorry chris did you want to oh, I, 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 uh, you raised the question of social care and mm -hmm. um, so did um, so did Ms. hamilton so i might cover mm -hmm. that bit i mean i think everyone agrees that social care vacancies are too high uh, there are a bit over 10% uh, at the uh, moment. Uh, we have early indications that uh, we think we might have uh, turned the corner and that those numbers are getting better, but we need to see those um, reflected in the, um, the actual national uh, figures. Uh, we are doing six things. Uh, overseas recruitment, which we've already uh, mentioned, which is um, actually going uh, rather well. Obviously, the new investment, the vast majority of that money in social care gets... Uh, uh, spent on uh, staff, it being a person business. Uh, we're working with both DWP and DFE uh, on recruiting into uh, uh, social care. We run our own recruitment uh, campaigns. I think the last one started on Boxing Day. I'm sure you've seen uh, that adverts. Uh, the career progression and skills piece, which is very, very important, as you've raised, which we've mentioned uh, before, and digitization uh, to uh, reduce the strains on the uh, uh, workforce. So we have a very comprehensive package. What we need to see, and of course, this is not an area where there's an industrial uh, dispute. What we need to see is that activity turn into the hard numbers and that vacancy rate uh, coming down. I'm um, um, certainly. We're if, move on to Ty in a minute. Okay, if I could just ask this please, one point please, on please, pay. Yeah. Um, why not have a job evaluation scheme? Agenda for Change works for staff in the NHS. Why not extend that to social care and ensure that they then can get the reward? 
rather than searching the world mm. over to find social care staff? Um, well, I mean, obviously, um, uh, to social care uh, is a private market. Uh, and the employers are uh, 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 private sector. Yeah, yeah but um, at, uh, uh, social care, well, I mean, it's a completely different style of um, uh, service uh, with uh, private, uh, private, uh, private employers. Yes, we do, uh, but the way it's set up at the moment, they are uh, private employers. Now, at the moment, uh, the vacancy rates in uh, the NHS and social care are actually quite similar, including for uh, nurses. Uh, so um, uh, it is uh, perhaps other factors than that that are uh, 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 that are driving. Now, what we do want to see, as I said, um, is uh, much more uh, focus on career progression and ladders uh, in social care and skills in social care. Because when you look at the turnover in social care, the vast majority of it, or well, sorry, a, a, a majority of it, is turnover within the social care sector as it were, so it's people sort of jumping around to different uh, jobs as opposed to leaving. There are people who leave and people, people who join. So we do want to look at, is there a better way of doing career progression? Obviously, turning it into the kind of public service where an AFC solution, that's obviously a much bigger uh, 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 thing. I'm describing what are we doing right now um, as I say, we've got early indications back that it is working. What we need to do is see that in the hard numbers so that I can, as it were, prove to you that it's working rather than uh, what I'm saying uh, right now. Okay, enough ladders. Um, for 10 minutes or so, uh, Ty is going to approach a very important subject of the women's health strategy. Um, over to you, Ty. Thank you, Chair. Actually, I just want to quickly go back to um, retention quickly. So Secretary of State, let's quickly imagine that you are a band five newly qualified nurse on a pay of £27,055. Monthly, that's £2,254.38. So when your NIN tax is deducted, you've got £386.27. Rent, £795. Energy bill, £175. Water bill, £34. Internet, £30.30p. Transport, £119.58p if you look at petrol. T council tax, £124.42. Road tax, £13.75. Phone bill, £38.22. TV lights is £13.25. Food bill, about £318. Car insurance, £47.50. And student finance, £15. So that all adds up to £117.24 and 2p at the end of the month, just for your basic monthly expenses. Now, when you take that away from your monthly um, earnings, that means that you're left with £144.29. Now, if you're an NHS staff who has to drive to work, which most of us do, and you have to pay to park, and um, in many cases, some of them will pay up to £200 per month to park. When you take that away from how much money you've got left, you've got minus £55.71 left. That's the reality for many NHS staff. So last week I was at my local hospital doing my pharmacy shift and one of the pharmacy staff asked me to ask you two questions. Charlotte said, when would the NHS, um, when would NHS staff stop having to pay to park at work? And the second question is, when will all NHS staff start to benefit from basic perks such as having milk provided to make a cup of tea? So what should I say to Charlotte when I see her uh, next week? Um, so I think, firstly, uh, in terms of uh, milk and things, there's always danger that things look tokenistic as a Secretary of State once you start straying into decisions on what an individual hospital does around milk uh, and, and items like that. So um, I think that's the sort of thing that a Chief Exec of a hospital and the senior management team, uh, recognising the importance of workforce, uh, the importance of retention that we've just been discussing, will want to talk to their staff council, talk to their, uh, their teams in terms of how they best support them. Uh, and it feels that where there are cost-effective things that can be done very constructively for staff, then um, those are the sort of things I would have thought an, an executive team the would be, parking, be looking sorry, at rather than me nationally sort of dictating. On the issue a, of parking. A, a par on. Uh, on parking, I think you, you raise a very um, important point in terms of certainly on staff surveys, Quite often, the issue of car parking comes up. Uh, that's particularly acute uh, where a shift overruns, uh, and sometimes that can have a, an impact uh, on car parking. With all these things, there are cost trade-offs uh, around uh, doing these things, and 
you know, we've been hearing about the, the importance of prioritising pay and that it's about pay and not non-pay benefits. And I think what your question very helpfully highlights is actually we should look at these issues in the round and actually sometimes non-pay benefits are also important alongside what is done on pay. Uh, in terms of your wider example around the, the fiscal pressure, um, at 27 That's fine, so stay. I'm just aware of time and I okay. know that the um, committee chair will have to move on to other people. I'm just going to move on to um, issues that are happening in community pharmacy. So you, as the Secretary of State, have um, the statutory responsibility to ensure that patients have access to medicine. Now, we're currently in a situation in this country where 670 pharmacies have shut in the past five years, with 40% of them being in the most deprived, deprived area <coughs> in this country. Do you think currently you are meeting that statutory responsibility to ensure that patients across the country have access to medicines fairly? We're investing more, so we put an extra 100 million on top of the 2.6 billion a year we commit to community pharmacy to expand the range of clinical uh, services. So we've got over 2 million patients that have been referred to community pharmacy from NHS 111 uh, as well. Uh, and one of the, the issues I'm very keen on is, is to explore what more we can do in pharmacy, uh, not least given the pressures on, on GPs and the opportunity to look at what it is currently people go to GPs for, where potentially there is scope to do more at the pharmacy. And we're already doing that, if you look at things okay, like... And I will be coming on to that. So, Lloyd Pharmacy announced a couple of days ago that they're going to shut 200 pharmacies in this country. Now, just looking at the pattern of pharmacies sh shutting, it means it's... For many pharmacists, we're starting to get this feeling that the government seems to be... Government's policy seems to be driving community pharmacies to collapse. Now, I just want to know, is the notion, is the government's notion that there's too many pharmacies in the country and they do need to shut, or is it, is there the problem that, you know, there might be um, professional snobbery within the NHS that means that pharmacy might not be able to provide services? Essentially, can the Secretary of State explain to me what the blocks are that are preventing the department from giving pharmacies a greater role for, that's going to benefit patients? Well, I... I don't know whether uh, when you, you sort of mentioned whether it, it's not very within, within the NHS. I think sometimes change is difficult. And what I, I think, share your desire uh, to do is to deliver change so that pharmacies do more. And the direction of travel on that, if I look at blood pressure, for example, we've got over 8,000 pharmacies now providing blood pressure checks. If I look at oral contraception, then that is... Uh, is a, a service that we're going so to... Oh, good to hear. And I really, I'm glad you're mentioning all these services that have been um, part of the PGD. But currently in the, in the country, we've got a situation where in Wales and Scotland, pharmacies first exist. The P PSNC, which is the Pharmaceutical Negotiating... No, Pharmaceutical Services Negotiating Committee, submitted to you last year um, a pharmacy-first model for this country to make it more beneficial for patients to make it more cost effective for patients, we still haven't heard anything and it's been a year since then. If you really are trying to really utilise community pharmacy, why has it taken you a year for a decision to be made? Well, I've only been appointed uh, less than 12 weeks. That's true, uh, that's true. So, yeah. so uh, perhaps you'll forgive me when we sort of talk about um, what was happening a, a year ago. Um, where I, I think actually there's strong agreement between us, which is that there's a significant role for pharmacy to do more. We need to look at the financing of that. Uh, but there's, I think, a clear trajectory in terms of additional services that can be delivered by pharmacy. I think pharmacy offers opportunity in terms of ease of access uh, and, and therefore different routes for, for patients. I'm very keen on one of the work streams we've already got uh, underway in the department is to look at how we repurpose the NHS app because that had 31 million people that downloaded it. It is largely downloaded so people could get their COVID pass. And often now is sat being underused yeah. on phones. And I think yeah. there's a huge opportunity to use yeah. the NHS app for people who may originally be planning to book a GP visit, but who, if they find out they can get the service they need from the pharmacist much quicker, Absolutely. through their app will see an opportunity. Sorry, I am just trying to be very conscious of time. Um, the reality is, is that community pharmacies are concerned Industry is not particularly happy, and I know you know the ongoing situation with BPAS. All this is impacting patient access to medicine in this country, and it's going to have a long-term impact. I need to ask this question again. Do you think you're doing all that you can to ensure that patients in this country have access to medicine 
like those in other developed countries? Well, um, yes, in that there's a huge focus through our Office for Life Science. I know Professor Chappell is very closely engaged and sort of leads the department on, on our work uh, on this around the £2.5 billion pounds that notwithstanding all the other economic pressures we face, there's £2.5 billion pounds going in, £1.5 billion through UKRI and, and £1.2 billion through NIHR. There's a huge amount about how we bring forward our life science work in terms of delivery uh, of medicines and other innovation into the NHS more swiftly. We have the opportunity through the, the scale of the NHS to negotiate uh, effectively in terms of price. There's a separate debate we can get into it, the VPAS around the life science industry, but there's no uh, question around our intent within government in terms of the prioritisation of the life science industry. I was at a breakfast with the Chancellor just last week with leaders of the life science uh, industry. The Minister for State has regular engagement. I know Professor Chappell does a huge amount of her time, which is exactly on these sort of medicines. Thank you, Sir Kajuste, and that's really good to hear. The only last thing that I'd probably say around that issue is the fact that obviously you are aware that two major pharmaceutical companies have left VPAS and that's something that's never happened before and they are genuine concerns about what that would mean in the future. I just want to ask one last question because I can see the chair looking at me about women's health strategy. Yes, please do. As a woman, um, it is an area which I'm passionate about. Now, it is, I was looking at the major strategy, um, the major condition, condition strategy and it was very obvious to me that gynecological conditions were omitted from the government's major condition strategy. Now, this is despite the fact that pretty much, you know, women experience, all women experience menopause and one in 10 women are living with endometriosis. Now, I have a constituent, Rachel, who, you know, despite only being 33 years old, needs to apply for a blue badge because she can't walk from her car to the shopping set, to the supermarket because she has endometriosis. So I'm just trying to understand why gynecological conditions was not included within the government's major condition strategy? So firstly, uh, if I may say, I don't think it's simply as someone, as a woman being passionate about women's health strategy, I as a man am passionate about it, as a father, as a husband, uh, half of my constituents and so forth. I have a, a very strong uh, interest when I was in the Treasury. Um, I led during my time there, uh, f first time around on, on the women in finance strategy. So, so I think this is something that unites us. I don't think it's simply you know, part of the committee oh, that's well, passionate yes. about it and the rest isn't. I think all of us should be. Um, and that's why we set out the, the, the women's health strategy uh, in the summer. I think there's, if I look at other key objectives for government in terms of, for example, cutting the electives waiting time, then actually the interaction with the women's health strategy is core to that because uh, some of the concentrations in terms of backlogs overlap with some of the priorities within the women's health uh, strategy. When I went to Homerton, for example, one of the things that was interesting there was actually moving some of the procedures uh, as part of the women's health strategy through their development of a one-stop shop, uh, a one-hub uh, approach. Uh, they could triple the productivity rate in terms of treat three times as many patients for the same procedure in their outpatients at Homerton compared to when it uh, was a theatre procedure with an aesthetist and the full uh, involvement of that. So, so I think there's, there's opportunities to bring these different strands of policy work within the department much more closely together. It is an absolute priority for us to do so. Uh, and it's something also that um, the ministerial team is very, very focused on. Yeah, uh, the one thing I'd add is, of course, the work of um, Dame Leslie Reagan, in, who we've appointed As in this area. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. OK, Paul Bristow. Uh, thank you very much. Secretary of State, the, um, the budget for the NHS in 2022-23 was £180.2 billion. It was reported last year that healthcare, I think by the IFS, the healthcare um, is forecast to account for 44% of budgeted departmental spending in 2024-25. What percentage of spend do you think is the right one to spend on healthcare? Um, well, as Secretary of State for Health, part of my job is to make the case uh, for um, increased health spending, but obviously my, one of my former roles was Chief Secretary where I'd probably look more at this issue in, in uh, the round. Um, I, I think the, well, I think it's rather than sec so firstly in terms of that figure which I've used myself in the past, we need to disaggregate Amy spend from day-to-day -day department spend. Yeah, so uh, 
um, just before sort of people misguise it as total government spending, because obviously there's an important distinction to draw. Um, I think the, the, my answer as Secretary of State for Health and Social Care is we need to spend the right amount to address the health needs of the country, and we can all see as a consequence of the pandemic that uh, demands have increased, uh, and that combines with the fact that we have uh, a more elderly population and those are presenting with more complex needs. But where I suspect, Mr Brewster, you and I would very much agree is um, regardless of where one settles on the quantum, we need to deliver value for money from that spend, and that's something that I think the transparency agenda that I'm committed to will help uh, in terms of people to in interrogate how the money is being spent. Well, that's exactly my point. I think the, the, the temptation, if there's, a, if there's a problem within the system somewhere, is to always call for more money to be spent on it. But when we're, when we're dealing with such colossal amounts, it's absolutely <coughs> crucial that that money is spent effectively <coughs> as possible. Now, I completely agree that your transparency <coughs> agenda is key to achieving that. But there are plenty of innovations, and I think you and I have spoken about this in the past. I even asked a question in the chamber the other day. Mm. There are plenty mm. of innovations that go on in our NHS, which does increase productivity, that are making a difference. But how do we get that spread across the NHS at pace and scale? What drivers and levers are there to make sure that they are spread? I think there's multiple ways uh, of doing so. So I think we touched earlier in the session of the work of, of Jim Mackey, Prof uh, Sir Jim Mackey and uh, Professor Tim Briggs, in terms of the get it right first time, uh, which has been um, very much data driven in terms of how you get the right clinical pathways uh, in place. Uh, I think there's work through uh, the national clinical leadership uh, within uh, NHS England, so um, whether that's on cancer, whether that's on urgent emergency care, uh, because uh, I, I think often these messages are best put by clinicians to other clinicians than necessarily ministers to those clinicians. So I think there's a big role for clinical leadership, uh, not least from uh, NHS England. Uh, I think thirdly, through greater transparency, uh, informing parliamentary colleagues, uh, um, uh, show not tell with ICB so they can see how their metrics sit against others. I think that transparency agenda um, under the old adage of what gets measured gets done uh, can be very effective in highlighting best practice. Uh, yeah. And I think what's within your question is, is the speed of adoption. So, you know, I think in the past I've talked more about um, innovation. Actually, it's the adoption of innovation. There's lots of innovation already within the NHS. It's how we scale that. Uh, to coin a phrase uh, to credit the perm sec, but for when I was last in the department, talked about industrializing that innovation across the piece. And I think looking at that variation is a key way in terms of getting better value for money. Okay. Well, that's good to hear, um, because you know we do look at bodies like GERFT. I completely agree that getting a real, right first time has made a real difference. Nice technology appraisals, nice guidance, is all compiled with all the evidence, but we're still seeing, culturally in, in our NHS, uptake far too slow. And I completely agree that transparency is key. Can I just press you slightly on, on this thing about parliamentary colleagues getting involved and, and seeing, seeing the data and that transparency? How, how do you envisage that working? Um, I think by uh, giving clearer information on ICBs uh, and what the data is, uh, so uh, engagement with parliamentary colleagues, uh, and I think more wider transparency. So, so I certainly as a constituency MP, yeah. I've often felt frustrated in trying to obtain information relating to my own constituency pertaining to health. Uh, and I don't think I'm necessarily alone as a constituency MP right. in having that experience. And so I think one of my roles as Secretary of State uh, on a cross-party basis, because ultimately when things go wrong, um, quite often they come back to the Secretary of the State. So the more MPs are empowered to ask uh, well-informed questions of their system, uh, I think that is actually a very helpful discussion to stimulate. Uh, and I think on many of these issues, um, there isn't anyone in the House that does not want to improve the cancer times in their constituency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that is something that is a common cause across the House. So, so let's be more transparent on the data uh, around that so that MPs feel better able to have some of these com conversations with our ICBs and hold them to account. 
Yeah, can I just urge you as well, on, on in terms of ICBs, that we're looking at commissioning policies, and I completely agree with you, actual local commissioning policies are often hidden on page 94 of a 200-page document, and it's very difficult to look at. But also, specialised commissioning as well. You know, we need greater transparency on service specifications and commissioning policies, and I would just urge you not to forget that when you, you go to the ICBs. Make sure NHS England and commissioning policies, we, we get that transparency there as well. Um, sorry, just slightly a different question, though. But culturally, I also feel one of the ways we're going to deal with the, with the COVID backlog is greater use of the independent sector. Um, I just think we need to just dispel that cultural problem of using the independent sector. We use it all the time. And we need a greater you know, kind of use of the independent sector. Um, how are we going to achieve that? And do you, do you feel there's a cultural uh, barrier to more use of the independent sector in the NHS? I, th I think it's mixed. I think some are more open to, to using the independent sector than others. Um, I think you're right to identify it as an opportunity, and it is part of our uh, recovery plan uh, in the elective recovery plan uh, to do so. Uh, I want to champion the interests of patients and empower patient choice. Uh, and I think there's ways of making that uh, easier for the patient through, for example, the NHS app moving forward. We're not there yet, but moving forward, I think we can do more through patient choice through the app. Um, but I think what the patient wants is where can they get treated as soon as possible, give the patient more choice uh, over that, providing we're guaranteeing as we are free at the point uh, of use, uh, then if there is capacity in the independent sector, then we should be maximising that. Uh, and I'm very keen that we do. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, okay, Dr Johnson is going to come in with a, a return, I'm sorry, to dentistry. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, so... I've raised this before in the House and, and with you uh, privately as well and with successive Secretaries of State. Very concerned about the number of patients who can't access NHS dentistry when they need to. And you're absolutely right that we've trained more dentists and there are more dentists per population than there uh, was 10 years ago. Um, but there are contract issues. There are fewer dentists working in the NHS to private balance. And there are more dentists working part-time hours than there were before. Um, what are you doing to address that? And what can I say to my constituents when they write to me saying, I can't find a dentist? Well, uh, as uh, you and I have chatted about this on a, on a number of occasions, uh, and uh, so there's some things that we have done uh, already. So we've got more bands for, for units of dental activity. Um, the introduction of minimum value for a unit of dental activity at uh, £23. Uh, uh, which was to help sustain practices where the 2006 reforms meant they were receiving very low payments uh, for the same work. We're allowing dentists to, to operate 110% of their contracted uh, UDA so that those that are able to uh, take on more uh, activity uh, can do so. We're supporting dental practitioners to operate at the top of, of their licence uh, and we're requiring dentists to keep their availability for NHS patients up to date uh, on the NHS website. But I recognise, Dr Johnson, you and I have discussed this, in terms of those are not the end, they're, they're very much the start of proceeding and there's much more that we need to do. Um, some of that we've touched already in terms of the international recruitment side. I think we need to make it easier to have overseas dentists practice uh, in the UK. Uh, and we also need to look at some of the innovations that are possible and things like the Centre for Dental Development in Ipswich. Uh, I, I think are opportunities in terms of things uh, we can support. So there's a significant amount of work going on within the department uh, on dentistry. I think the firm set would say it's an area that receives much more ministerial focus today than perhaps might have been the case uh, in the past. Uh, and I think that reflects the fact that across the House, I think there's much more parliamentary interest in dentistry than perhaps yeah. was the case uh, in the past. So it is something we're very actively working on, some steps have been taken, um, but we recognise there's a lot more to do. Thank you. Um, I'd like a centre of dental development in Sleaford, uh, uh, as, as you're well aware. Um, and I'm also curious about why you only let people work to 110% of their contract. If they can do more, why not let them get on with it? Um, but my other specific question about um, dentistry is about military pe personnel and their families. So mm. we know we have the Armed Forces Covenant enshrined in law and our commitment to our service um, personnel and their families. And we know that we should be ensuring that those who are military service and their families not, um, de do not have a detrimental um, access to public se services as a result. And yet, having a number of RF bases, my, my mm. constituency means I do see that m populations are moving around. And though the service personnel themselves 
are covered by de the military dentists. Their families are not, which means that as these families move around, their, their children in particular and their spouses are not able to access uh, NHS dental services because by the time they get to the end of a waiting list, they're moved again. Now, they have to get a dentist and then they're moved again to somewhere else around the country. They can't travel quite so far to get to. So what work are you doing with the MOD to ensure that we as a government who are, who are so committed to the uh, Armed Forces Covenant achieve it for these families with dentistry? I, th I think you raise a very good point and I'm seeing the Veterans Minister as it happens tomorrow so I will ensure that uh, these points are, are shared with him. Um, the area I've been discussing more with him has been in the context of mental health so the work we've been doing around Op Courage uh, which I accept isn't on the dentistry side but the significant work we've been doing there uh, where we've been increasing the funding from uh, 70 million to 22 and a half uh, million uh, from April uh, and we've seen uh, 26,000 referrals in total so so I think that gives a direction of travel I think you raise an important point because we are as a government hugely committed to veterans uh, and to the covenant that is a clear priority of the Prime Minister uh, and the government as a whole that's a very clear message he has given uh, to me uh, that is work we've been doing uh, as I say uh, with our courage with the veterans trauma network with the raising of the profile of veterans through the accreditation scheme with GPs, for example, and others. So there's work we have been doing. Um, let me pick up uh, tomorrow with the Veterans Minister the specific points around dentistry, and I'm very happy to write to you on that. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you very much. A couple other things, um, Secretary of State. Um, the new hospitals programme. Mm. Delays to the business case approval. Obviously, cohorts one and two are either in flight or they have a, a programmed time scale um, but there's uncertainty about the capital allocation I think is, is, is an established fact so therefore cohorts three and four trusts which I declare my interest includes Hampshire hospitals which I have part of in my constituency they've got pretty significant delays to their timelines and obviously they're spending money on make do amend and I hear this from colleagues across the house who speak to me as chairs committee what is the situation with the new hospitals program well there's probably no issue that is raised more frequently with me by uh, parliamentary colleagues I'm absolutely uh, fully cited on the uh, importance of it and it's one that I uh, very much uh, share uh, firstly there's an interaction with the rack hospitals there's two of the seven that are within the For the Hospitals programme, but there's five that are not, uh, and we need to look at how we address uh, those within the wider uh, estates uh, plan. Um, we are in the process of firming up the standardisation of the new hospitals, the Hospital 2.0, that Lord Markham has been doing a huge amount of work on. Um, I am very struck by the fact that nine of the last ten hospitals that have been built in England were over time and over budget. Uh, and I we do believe we need a fundamental shift away from bespoke local designs mm -hmm. by local chief execs into a more standardised, modular, uh, modern method of construction uh, approach. And that is what Lord Markham, on my behalf, has been tasked with delivering. He's working at pace uh, on that. Uh, that will then allow us the certainty in terms of cost um, to, uh, in terms of our discussions with Treasury linking it to the RAC discussion in order to then be able to, to move the programme forward. So, so I'm acutely aware of the widespread interest from parliamentary colleagues. We are working very intently in government with Treasury colleagues uh, to move that forward and I'm hoping to be able to update soon on that. I mean, would, would the budget be a reasonable time frame? It would, I, I, I fear I would uh, be remiss with my firm set here in over committing to a uh, time yes. scale on this. Um, <laughs> what I can reassure you, uh, Chairman, is uh, I absolutely hear that it's an extremely important issue for parliamentary colleagues and also to staff in those hospitals. And again, on a, a show not tell basis, the fact that I've been to Wix Cross, I've been to Hillenden, I've been to Leeds, I've been to Watford, you know, I've been to a number of these hospitals and seen firsthand the estate. I'm very, they're all cohort three hospitals. I've been to the racks like uh, Kings Lynn uh, and so forth. So I'm very acutely aware of the issue uh, and I'm very actively okay. discussing that with Treasury. Um, although the Permanent Secretary will remember from my time in the department, over promising on commitments is a hell of a way to get uh, things happening sometimes. Um, but I'm going to bring Rachel Masquin in a minute on, uh, on prevention. I just wanted to ask 
one other thing. On, on the workforce plan, obviously this committee successfully argued for there to be an independent assessment of that. Um, do you have an individual earmarked for that? Um, I don't have an individual uh, to name today, okay. but I, I recognise that there was uh, an agreement, not least um, your, your predecessor as chair, um, we're keen on independent verification, and that is something the government has accepted. Okay, and then just sort of introduce the subject of prevention. You'll be aware this committee has uh, mm -hmm. launched a major inquiry on prevention. We've uh, produced a um, request for ideas, mm -hmm. um, which closes in a week's time. We've had a big response already. I know you're a big supporter of that work, uh, as is the Perm Sec, so we've spoken about it. Um, is it sustainable? I mean, I'm just reading an article in Bloomberg last week, which is titled Britain's Black Hole is Devouring the Whole Country. Britain's NHS Black Hole is Devouring the Whole Country. Is it sustainable to see health spending growing faster than our GDP while demand, and you talked about demand earlier, you talked about demand of the ambulance service, 100 times the number of people in, in the acute setting with flu, demand just keeps rising. Is that sustainable? And do you appreciate that prevention has to be something that we're serious about if the NHS is to be sustainable. I'm hugely focused on prevention, so notwithstanding the, the immediate challenges that we've seen in our a &E departments and that we see elsewhere in the healthcare system, um, something both with, with uh, Chris and Lucy but also with the Chief Medical Officer as well, it is something that we've taken a very conscious decision in the department to ring fence time for notwithstanding the other pressures that there are. Uh, will you work the, Will you work with us? I mean, you mentioned the Chief Medical Officer, who is obviously mm. you know, talking about air quality and its impact on heart disease, cardiovascular disease. There's now some emerging evidence around air quality and cancer. Um, you know, we, we want to look at poor housing as a determinant of poor health. Um, will you work with us on this inquiry strategy? I'm, so I'm instead? massively interested in it because I'm a very... So firstly, would I, of course, I'd be delighted to work constructively with the, the committee, but I'm hugely interested in prevention. I think sometimes the political debate has gone into the wrong place around banning things and lots of debates around what's sold uh, at the till, when what I'm very interested in is, is uh, how we fast track uh, the adoption of innovation, how we work more closely with our life sciences, how we do things at much bigger scale. So if you've got an obesity drug, for example, that will take significant, uh, have a significant impact uh, and we have a significant societal challenge in terms of obesity and the interaction with diabetes and other conditions, then how we look at that in a much more ambitious way is the sort of area that's very uh, interesting to explore. We look at the pressures from mental health, we look at the pressures from mm -hmm. MSK, um, we're committed to the various missions, the cancer mission, the dementia mission, the big plays that we've set out. But one of the things, and, and you know, Professor Chappell uh, does a huge amount of work on this agenda within the department, but how we bring that innovation away from being three, five, ten years away and how we start to bring it more into the pressures the NHS face, but deliver that uh, in different ways. And I think one of the challenges with COVID is we don't, having innovated during COVID, we don't slip back into the old ways of doing things. So how do we channel some of that COVID innovation into the prevention work? Uh, and, and roll that out through different delivery models uh, and a, a fundamentally yeah. different. Sorry, way. I just add, of course, uh, yeah. and a big ICS role. Yes, uh, to, uh, is the other thing. So the ICS I happened to be talking to last week was looking at the question of um, how, do, how, how, how do we basically eliminate uh, child asthma deaths by early intervention by spotting sure. the people who might be in that category and intervening early, and that was central yeah. to their mission. I mean, it's your secondary prevention sure. point. I, I mean, I really welcome um, the focus that you're putting on it. I think the other thing is we've got to shift people's mindset of thinking that prevention is something uh, to do w with outcomes in the, you know, the 10 years, 20 years, and make it relevant to them now, mm. because there are some, we should show what can you do now that's going to have an impact in the next six to 12 months? M make it more real for them. I think the other thing that I really am sure you're going to see is a focus on health inequalities. Mm, yes. So if we put our, our prevention agenda mm. and say we, we create it for those where, where the disparities are greatest, where variation is high, then we're going to have a prevention service that works. Yep. And the third thing is what you said about other government departments. There's lots mm. that we can do in the Department of Health and Social Care, but we need to get other government departments on board with this mm -hmm. and to make it, uh, to, to see, to think about it as co-benefits. Yes, you'll have benefits in health, 
But there are also, for example, benefits, and whether it's in transport or education or so many government departments, I think this is uh, the time to grasp it. Uh, that, that's great. Okay, so uh, our closer, uh, we're going to return to Rachel. And I know I'm not allowed to, uh, to ask a question because that's how these things work. But of course, Jeffrey, on the prevention side, so I think there's a huge amount more that could be done on social prescribing. And in terms of working with other select committees and how we interact on that, I just think that's a very uh, underdeveloped well, area of policy. That's, that's great. And we do engage with the, the rather marvellous Helen Stokes Lampard um, on the social prescribing issue. Yes. Rachel. Thank you. And that, that's really encouraging. And I wanted to make sure that prevention was part of our conversation towards the end. Does this mean that you're going to, with your commitment, see an increase in budget towards prevention? So we we fo bring a refocus and are we going to see the health disparities white paper emerge uh, or has that been buried and finally on budget just want to know what's happening with the public health grant because um, the next year is about to start and it seems that having these one-year cycles that looking at public health somewhat defeats the object of the exercise when we should be thinking much more longer term about how we're bringing in prevention um, so I think Firstly, we're thinking of my former Treasury hat, I think there, there is a long debate in government around one-year budgets that have rolled over and how they operate versus the ability to contract for longer. Uh, and perhaps an example of that was school sport, where you often have a one-year rollover and, and could you actually make that more effective if you were there? And, and I think that's a, a longer-term thing. In terms of prevention, I, I, so I think the scope, and this is why I say about channeling the COVID innovation, just to do things very differently. So I went and visited, for example, recently a, a really good innovation, uh, one of the London hospitals where in the emergency department they're screening people who consent, but screening for HIV, Hep B and Hep C. And what that does is that it, it picks up cases of people that didn't realise they had those conditions. Uh, because you can then treat them so much earlier, the patient outcomes are vastly superior. Secondly, inadvertently, they're not transmitting mm -hmm. to other people through not knowing that they had the condition. And thirdly, it's obviously hugely cheaper because you're capturing it much earlier rather than the cost of treating them uh, downstream. And all of this, I think, comes back to me to the data piece because then looking at uh, what are, as Professor Chappell says, the health inequalities, how do we get upstream of those? How do we do those in different ways? So it might be the case you don't need all the screening to be done in the individual trust. You could look at having a national... Um, centre and have a different delivery model. So, so I think we've got to be open to, to delivering in different ways. But the, what I want to reassure you on is, is the commitment, certainly of, of you know, the, the firm set, the CSA, the CMO, the, you know, the senior team within the Department of Health, we are hugely cited on the importance of prevention. And I think that speaks to the longer term sustainability in terms of health. Yeah. Will we get the white paper? Well, again, there's an obsession in, in politics around producing paper. What I'm interested in is getting on and delivering with things, and that's what no. I'm particularly focused on. Yeah, I mean, I was going to add, I mean, if, if the chief medical officer were here, he, he, he would also talk about getting all the basic things right, particularly vaccination. Yeah. You know, we're going to talk about prevention. That's one of our absolutely, you know, all those screening programmes, all those vaccination programmes. But because they're there, we don't tend to talk about but actually those are, the, well, Lucy will correct me, are absolute bedrocks yeah. of a prevention system. But I think we need to see prevention as everybody's business and we just need to normalise it so that you might be going to your community pharmacist and we look at opportunities so that it's just woven through what we do. And particularly with the, the issue of secondary prevention now, we need to make sure that we see it as every healthcare professional's business and normal for a patient or public member of the public to be asked about the wider things that they can do here and now. So not something special that you go and do in a special place. We can, we can deliver it in many different ways. That's why we've got the lung cancer vans going to supermarket car parks and just bringing it to, to, to where, where the people are. And to finish with a practical example, earlier this month I signed the, the deal with BioNTech, which to Permasec's point about vaccines, hopefully is about how do we develop, uh, working with the best of industry, innovative vaccines in that case on the cancer side, to look at bringing, you know, Lucy's point in terms of health inequalities, getting upstream, using vaccination, and how do we do that? And, and that, as, a, as a, a show of the government's commitment to prevention, whether the Moderna deal or the BioNTech deal are good examples of how committed we are to that.
Thank you very much. By my reckoning, we've been in session for two hours, eight minutes, and we've covered 21 different subjects. Hey. So that's not bad going. <laughs> thank you very much, Sir Chris Wormold, Steve Barclay, Secretary of State, Professor Lucy Chappell. Thank you for coming in and giving evidence to us today. Order, order. The proceeding has ended.